for so many reasons, but really the main reason of all is the fact that he's able to forgive us of our sins and cleanse our hearts and make us what we ought to be. Unworthy as we are, but yet the grace of God is so beautiful, so wonderful. And so on that alone, we just praise him and worship him tonight and then just throw in all of his benefits and all of his blessings. Let's just worship him together tonight. We're so glad that you're here and uh, trusting God just to come and, and move among us. Good to see all of our, our college students here, our church folk here. And it's good to have Jose and Elena Garcia uh, in from North Palm Beach. I've been watching online for the last year or so. They attend church, but they also watch online here. Welcome. Nice to meet you, and we're glad that you're here and trusting that most of all, God will come and meet with us tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your many blessings and your goodness to us. Dear Lord, for your help already in this, this meeting. And so, Lord, as we gather in tonight, it's a brand new service. It's a brand new time together, dear Lord. We're just asking that as you administer to us and speak to us, that we'd have hearts that would be open to you, ears that would hear, and a, and a will that says, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and way. And God, as you would help us, and as we would respond in obedience to you, we're just going to praise you ahead of time for how you're going to help us and what's going to be accomplished. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing. Good evening. Asking, if you will, to stand with me tonight if you're able. And we're going to sing a little while about the grace of God tonight. I'm so thankful for the amazing grace of God that's been extended to me. Let's sing about it for a little while tonight. If you're using a hymnal 354, all because of God's amazing grace. Amazing grace, oh how sweet.
tells us, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obe obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm thankful that grace is greater than anything that you can do. Grace is greater than any sin that I can commit. Grace is greater than all our sins. Sing with me tonight the familiar song, Grace That Is Greater Than All Our Sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin.
Amen. My heart rejoices with yours tonight as we think of God's grace that's been extended to us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but Jesus Christ has, through his mercy and grace, has raised us to new life in him. And we rejoice in that this evening, that our sins are forgiven. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed them. And it's so good to be free from that load of sin tonight. We give him praise and we rejoice. Let's stand together and let's lift a good volume of praise to our God, thanking him for the grace that's been extended to us. It's a privilege to have Brother Solomon Kittipa from Papua New Guinea. He's going to be coming and praying for us, leading in prayer. He's a small man, but dynamite comes in small packages. Let's lift together with him and let's give praise to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this afternoon. You are so great. You are so mighty. You are so great. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of God of Jacob, tonight we pray that God, yes. we need your power and your glory. Yes. We need revival tonight, God. Yes. Jesus, we need you. Yes. We pray for this uh, church, Hope Sound Bible Church, yes. Hope Sound people, the community around God, we pray. Let the people can feel the power of God tonight. Yes. Let the church can be revival tonight. Let the church can be filled with the Holy Ghost of God tonight. Let the college may feel with the Spirit of God walk among us, with the staff and with the student, with the pastor and with the church members, and the community around us. We need you, God. Tonight we pray that, Lord, let your powers from heaven, let the glory from heaven, let the heaven doors may open, let the Spirit of the Lord may flow down tonight, and we can feel the presence of God tonight. We can be at the service with the Lord. Let the Lord be in the midst of us. So that we can feel the presence of God. We can enjoy our service with Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let the Holy Spirit can lead us tonight. We pray, God. We believe and trust in you, Jesus, tonight. Father God, we will bring your message delivered by the Holy Spirit tonight. The preacher is ready to deliver the message. And we pray that we believe you. We trust in you, God, tonight. We will enjoy the service with you. Praise the Lord. Tonight we need you, Jesus. We pray you come in your mighty and your power to bless us tonight with the message and the songs, the rest of the service. For the songs that we're going to sing, you help us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I find so hard to bear 
thankful for that tonight. Jesus never fails. Man, as I look across this crowd tonight and as I was just watching different ones, I look back and see, so good to have Pastor Pierpoint here again tonight, but seeing there raising his hands and thinking, God's brought him thus far and God's going to safely see him through, but what an encouragement to a 44-year-old sitting up here on the platform looking back there saying, God has never failed him, he's never failed me, and, and there's hope, there's hope in the name of Jesus. He's got a track record to prove it, he never fails, and uh, I like the, the positivity of the song, you might as well get behind me Satan, you might as well get there because Jesus never fails, hallelujah, amen. Thank you so much for that beautiful song, thank you God for 
for driving it home to our heart again this evening. Praise his name. Wow. Well, it's kind of hard to shift from that to taking an offering, but it's what we're going to do. If our ushers would come, Lord bless you as you give. We need, we need around $6,300 to make this revival meeting happen. And, uh, and you gave greatly last night. We're asking that you'd continue to do so uh, this evening. All of the money taken in the evening services uh, will be going towards the financial end of this meeting. So, Lord, bless you as you give. Dear Heavenly Father, we just continue to worship you. Thank you for your, your goodness and your grace, your Lord, your mercy and faithfulness to us. Now, Lord, we're asking that as we continue to worship you in, in music and giving, we ask that, God, that we would just sense your hand of blessing in it. In Jesus' name, amen. for your giving and the offering tonight and certainly have been enjoying the offertory music that we've experienced throughout the revival and uh, more than you giving in the offering uh, we just want to say a huge thank you for putting this revival meeting on your calendar clearing your schedule and being here your attendance means more than anything and uh, I just believe that God is doing something special and we we've we've experienced that already in this service here tonight he's come on purpose and I believe that he wants to accomplish something as we uh, move on uh, through this service. And so the calls will be singing a special song. And then our evangelist, Brother John Manley, will be delivering his heart this evening. Uh, let's just continue to tune in to the voice of God in this part of the service. Amen.
Thank you, Coles, for your beautiful music tonight and also the wonderful worship that they've led us in this evening. We appreciate that so much. Good evening. It's good to see you in church tonight. I know that none of you just happened to be here tonight. You, you came on purpose. And if life is anything like it is for us, you have to fight for some things. And uh, you fought to be in church tonight, and I respect that, and I appreciate it. And I know some of you had to be here, but I'm glad that you're still here, too. Genesis chapter 35 is where we were last night, and that's where we're headed again tonight. We looked at a character that God in his wisdom gave us a good bit of information about. He, he didn't reach to the upper shelves of his great work when he began working with Jacob, but he reached down to a pretty messy character and he began to bring him up. And I can rejoice tonight that the God who does that for Jacob could also do something for us. We talked about the different times and seasons of his life, those, those reckless years where he, he just lived like there would never be a consequence for his mean behavior. But those years turned into some running years because he made some enemies, and you know what it is to have to run from your, enemy, from your enemies. But then his sowing began to reap he began to find himself having to deal with some of the consequences of his behavior. But in the midst of his reaping years, God still had a plan. And the section that we begin in chapter 35 of Genesis is what I like to think of as the rebuilding years of Jacob. Do you think it's possible that God could redo something with us? Some time ago, I, I was driving down the road with a friend of mine, and he lives in a different part of the country, and he, he pointed to this dump of a house alongside the road with every imaginable item of trash in the front and side yards and all around. And he said, see that place right there? Yeah. He said, that man will be in church on Sunday probably. And he's just lived that way for many years. He just got really used to it, I suppose. Now, isn't it funny that we can look at somebody else's mess and it just bothers us? But isn't it amazing how we can just get so used to our own mess that we think it's never going to change? It's always going to be this way. But I'm, I'm here to represent a God who, who's in the business of rebuilding lives. And I'm not here to waste your time, and God's not here to waste your time. And I actually believe that any man who's in Christ Jesus can be a new creation. God can, God can do good things in our lives. If I could take you to the town where I pastor and just a few blocks from the church building where we meet, there's uh, an authentic Mexican restaurant that we like to go to called Taco Bell. <laughs> oh, you've been there apparently, huh? I'm being generous. It got so bad that uh, we just stopped going there some years ago. I mean, you order something and you'd better check the bag because if you pull away and it's not what you ordered, you do not want to set through that line again. And you know how all of that stuff goes. And you just finally say, I'm done with this place. But then you have a busy day at church and you need to grab something to eat and you, you just say, I'm going to try it again. And one day we did try it again. And to our surprise, I mean, you go and you get what you order. I mean, everything was right. And you think, surely something's changed. We went again and found it to be much like that again. And it was just, it was right and it was good and it was decent like you'd expect. Well, good is, relatively speaking, you understand one day, I just couldn't help myself. I, I was inside the restaurant, and I saw them having a little, little huddle. They kind of having some type of an employee meeting or something. And I just stepped over to where they were meeting, and I just said, I don't know what you folks have done around here, but you've turned this place around. And there was a man sitting in the corner of that little circle 
And he got a little half grin on his face, and they began to point fingers at him, and they said, it's all because of him. And he said, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> now, if I owned a Taco Bell, I would want to hire that guy to be the manager. I, I think that's the kind of guy that I would like to have on my team. If a man can get a vision and turn a restaurant around so that he satisfies his customers and his bosses above him and the stakeholders, whoever they may be. Do you think, do you think that the God who made us would also want to say, I, I would like to turn some things around for you as well? Genesis 34 is a dark and depressing chapter of the Bible. There we find Jacob and his family living without a spiritual compass, just, just not really sensing any divine plan in their lives. and they're, they're not going anywhere good, it seems. It's amazing how families can get in a funk. It's amazing how we can lose our sense of purpose and why we're even here. And Jacob was so distressed with his boys and how they were living. He said, you've become a stench in the nostrils of our neighbor. You've just, you've just given us a bad name. Long ago, Jacob had made a promise that if God would spare his life when his brother was trying to kill him, that he would go back to Bethel, that place where he had first built an altar to God. And he said, I will build an altar here again and I will worship but you remember, the pressure's off now. I mean, there's no army after him. There's no brother ready to kill him. He's got peace and prosperity. He's got a very unfulfilled purpose in life, too. But I remind you that God has promised to work in this family. His grandfather Abraham had received the promise that through his seed, he would bless the world. And if you're heaven's angels looking on and you're saying, Holy Father, are you sure this is how you plan to bring the Messiah into the world? And it's through that backdrop that the amazing God of heaven issues this altar call to Jacob. And he says in chapter 35, Jacob, I want you to arise and go back to Bethel, to the place where you made a vow to me when you were fleeing from the face of Esau, your brother. So last night we talked about God's altar call and what it, what it originally means, what it first means is God wants to reestablish contact with us. And this he does want to do. I want to think for a little bit about Jacob's response to that. Because God can call, and then the ball's kind of in our court, isn't it? We, we have to decide, are we going to follow through with this or not? And, and heaven holds its breath almost wondering, what's going to happen to this man? Let's read what the Bible tells us happened. God said unto Jacob, Genesis 35, verse 1, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there. And make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all who were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all their strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid or buried them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar 
and called the place El Bethel because their God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of Esau, his brother. For these rebuilding years to unfold, there's some things that Jacob needs to be willing to cooperate with. A couple of things that I want you to think with me about primarily tonight is for a spiritual recovery to happen, for a spiritual turnaround to happen, for that tide to turn in a family, God has to get somebody's attention. And I dare say if many of us would tell our family history, spiritually speaking, it could be traced back to somewhere, someone. God really got their attention. And that began to change the trajectory of the whole family. But now some of those are already gone. And maybe, maybe your family feels a little bit like Jacob's family felt in chapter 34 where you're not sure where you're headed or what you're doing or what your purpose is. There's some things that we can learn from this lesson. The first thing I want you to think about is this. Jacob took personal responsibility. That's just, just not a popular theme these days, is it? I mean, it's, it's, it's so much easier for us to blame somebody else. It's, it's much easier for us to expect someone else to pay our way. It's, it's easier for us to ride on somebody else's coattail. But, but when it comes to a spiritual turnaround, a spiritual recovery... It begins when somebody gets very willing to do something personally. If none go with me, still I must follow. As for me in my house, as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Now some of you know the story of, of Jacob's uh, background and, you know, his, his, uh, his dad seemed to favor his brother Esau, but his mother was... Boy, she was, she was uh, really in his corner. Matter of fact, she helped set up this whole deceiving thing when he got the blessing that was going to his brother. And I think that would have been a really good place for Jacob to say, hey, you know, my problem is my mom. She, she kind of messed me up. She, she gave me this idea and she helped conspire with me. It's all her fault. Blaming our parents is an easy thing to do. And Hey, I'm a parent, and uh, I found out uh, I'm, I'm blameworthy many times, believe me. I've said to my kids, I, I hope you don't end up on a couch somewhere telling how badly your parents raised you, but if you have anything to tell me, tell me now, please, so we can start working on it now. But as badly as some of us have been raised, there comes a point where we have to step away from that even and say, I, I can't blame anybody anymore. Jacob said, there I will make an altar unto the Lord, verse 3. You, you want to get on the fast track spiritually to a turnaround, to a recovery? It's time to take personal responsibility. It might not be your favorite style of music that they sing at church. You may have a dull Sunday school teacher. You, you may criticize this person or that person or, or have something to say about everything that is in your world. But as it comes right down to it is we have to say to ourselves, am I willing to follow Jesus? Am I willing to keep putting one foot in front of the other? And this is the time that we get real honest with ourselves and say, I'm stopping the excusing. I'm, I'm just not going to play that game anymore. I'm not going to let anybody else live in my head any longer or distract my life. As for me, I'm going forward. If you'll do that, my good friends, I have great hope for you. The prospects of your future are glorious. If you allow God to just help you walk out of your past and into the future. I'm not saying there aren't moments that you might need somebody to help walk you through some painful memories and work through some situations that are just devastating. But I'm saying in the depths of our heart, we have to say, I'm not living in yesterday. I'm moving forward to where God wants me to be. Jacob not only takes personal responsibility, but he begins to show spiritual leadership. 
This is fascinating to me. I've heard a lot about spiritual leadership, but I haven't always understood what does that look like? What, can you give me some example? Can you show me what that is? And I think, I think personally, Jacob provides some great examples here of what spiritual leadership could look like. Because I've been told many times, you know, be a man, lead the way, show, show spiritual leadership. And, and yet, how many of us have not always had a great example to point to and say, okay, they taught me, they showed me. Well, let's take a moment to look to see what, maybe Jacob could teach us a few things about what spiritual leadership looks like. After God spoke to him, verse 2 says this, Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him. So he's speaking to his wives, his children, to his servants, the whole lot of them. He's, he's saying, listen up, put away the strange gods that are among you, those Gods of the strangers, more technically translated, that you picked up from the people around us. Be clean, change your garments. Let us arise. Look at that. This is, this is a team effort. This is a combined effort. Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with, with me in the way which I went. Any of you that have moved recently, you, you know the daunting task of uprooting a family. You know how painful that is. There has to be a bigger goal than comfort that motivates you. For some of us, that's, that's the call to a better life. Some of us, it's the call to God's will of our lives, and we'll, we'll do that. Whatever it was that gripped Jacob right here got him so convinced that they needed to move that he was willing to cast the vision to his family and call them to follow. If you're, if you're taking notes tonight, I'm going to try to flesh this out just a little bit. A, B, C, and D. What's some spiritual leadership traits look like? A, for action. As soon as he got clear what God wanted him to do, what does Jacob do? He starts reserving the U-Haul. He calls a family meeting. He says, it's, it's time to move. Talking has its place. Planning has its place. But it does not compare to action. We can come to a meeting just like we're in tonight, and some of us kind of get that window again into the heavenly world, and we see, yes, that's what I need to do. That's who I need to be. That's what adjustments I need to make. And we can feel good about it. Or sometimes we feel a little convicted about it, and then we, we say, I'm going to do it. But doing it sometimes is where the tough thing is, isn't it? Spiritual leadership means acting, and Jacob was willing to act. Letter B, spiritual leadership involves sometimes some boldness, some, some bold moves, moves that raise the eyebrows of your neighbor sometimes. And sometimes raise the eyebrows of your family sometimes. What? People don't move, do they? They do, when God calls them to. I was a boy probably, I know I was less than seven years old because that was the time we moved from the house where this incident took place. I had a neighbor that had a, a go-kart, and I always wanted to ride that, and I asked him many times if he'd let me, but he always turned me down, except one time he said yes. I got so excited about riding that go-kart, he tried to tell me which pedal was the gas and which one was the brake, and I didn't pay attention much. I just wanted to ride it, and I got on that thing, and I tromped that pedal down, and I started heading down this little alleyway. The road in front of our house was a state highway. The traffic moved very rapidly along that road, and 
I started headed straight for that road. By the mercy of God, my dad was in the yard that day out doing something, and he saw what was happening. My dad took off on a dead run after me, and just in time, he grabbed the roll bar of that go-kart and stopped me before I got right out into the road. I didn't realize the danger I was in at the moment, but I knew I was out of control. It's funny. <laughs> I think as long as I still have a memory, I'll remember what he said. He said, you have no more business driving this thing than the man on the moon. I don't know what he said, but, or why, why he said that, or what he meant by that. And come to think of it, I don't always know what I mean when I say some things to my children when I'm really worked up. I, I just say things. And it doesn't always come out. But this I know, he... He was willing to make a bold move to do something to save me. There's no dignified way to run across the yard and chase a go-kart. There's just no dignified way to do that. Some of you remember back at the, uh, the horrific Columbine shooting and that, that precious girl, Cassie Phenom. That book that was written about her, that when she was asked by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, do you believe in Jesus? She said yes, according to the reports. And she was heralded as a, a faithful Christian to the point of death. If you ever read that book, you'll find a fascinating backstory to that. That, that girl wasn't always a Christian. Matter of fact, she lived a, a life that was tampering with some very evil and dark things. She was in a bad school and bad influences, and her parents pulled her out of that school against her will, didn't want to leave, but they said, you're not staying in this environment, and placed her into another environment, and she kicked and screamed all the way. In the mercy of God, she was introduced to a Christian youth group and found herself at a Christian camp one time. And if I remember the story correctly, she said, I still don't remember what the preachers were preaching, but I remember something about the music that was being sung and played, and it gripped her heart and began to soften that heart. And she came to know Jesus Christ and can only imagine how tough it must have been for her parents to make a bold move. But in their lives today, they don't regret. Even though they've lost a daughter to this earth, they've, they've got confidence they'll see her again. I don't, I don't particularly care to cross my children, do you? I mean, I want to give them the world. I want to give them everything their hearts desired. But when that desire crosses God's plan for their lives and the good of their eternal souls, something's got to give. And it takes some boldness sometimes to say, no, no, we're, we're not doing that. Letter C is what I call convictions, and I, I don't know how, how you would define convictions, but I like to think about convictions like this. They are those, those boundaries that God gives us that come from our understanding of his will for our lives. You know, God actually talks to us about real life things in his book. He, he really... He, he really does. And I, I would say to you tonight, if you're an earnest-hearted Christian, endeavoring to live an obedient life to the Savior, he's going to talk to you about something in his word. You're going to hear him talk to you about something. Something. Because he's, he's working on us. He's shaping us. He's, he's conforming us to the image of Christ. 
And that's what his word does. And so when he speaks to us, it ought to be translated into some kind of behavioral change in our lives. And that's not legalism. That's loving obedience. That's saying, because I love you, I will walk in your way. I actually think your way is better than my way. And so those convictions are, are a little bit like these little boundary markers that we begin to put down and say, eh, I, I get in trouble when I do that, so I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to put this boundary here, and I'm going to follow that. And so those convictions are very powerful. It's fascinating to me that when God told, tells Jacob, go back to Bethel, he doesn't tell him anything about the clothes they need to change, about any of the jewelry that they have. He doesn't say anything about their garments or anything. But instinctively, Jacob says, um, tell you what, let's leave some of this stuff here. Some of these gods that we've collected, let's, let's, just, let's just leave them here. So what is he doing? He's, he's, he's translating into real life the things that he is believing would please God. Uh, we, we lived for several years in a uh, city neighborhood and we're always concerned about the safety of our children. You just, you just don't let them go out and play without some type of supervision. And I remember our daughter... Um, getting a bicycle when she was young and wanting to ride and and so I would say now oh, sis just don't go very far we, we want to be able to see you and boy I was a nervous wreck I'd look out there and I'd see oh, she's getting a little far and and then I'd say come back come back and she said I don't know what a little far is and so I said all right let's do this you see that stop sign down there That'll be the point that we'll end on that end of the street. And then this one over here, that will be the other end. Okay? So we'll, as long as you're between those two stop signs, I think we're going to be okay. So you just have at it. Now, I, I, don't, I don't profess to be a smart guy, but I was like, that was a great idea. <laughs> because you know what it did? It gave her a sense of freedom, and it gave me a sense of freedom, too because we actually had some kind of a boundary. And she, she, for the most part, just willingly abided with that in her life. I'm not here to tell you where God's going to put the boundaries in your life, but I'm, I'm here to say, following the Spirit's voice means sometimes he's going to say, this is off limits for you and this is on limits for you. You're, you're, you're safe here, you're not safe there. Is that radical? Is that ridiculous? Because if you don't have something like that, it's amazing how you just morph into things that you never dreamed. Fast forward the clock several years. And uh, she's not a girl on a bicycle anymore wondering about how far to ride, but um, there's other issues that begin to come up. And there's, there's friends who are Christians who do these things that we don't do, and there's other people that maybe have different opinions or interpretations of things. And so she's struggling with that. And so we're talking about that, which I encourage. I think it's great to have those conversations. And so I said, Sis, you remember, you remember when we we set those stop signs as the boundaries in your life. Yeah. Now, it's not against the law of the state to go past that stop sign or this stop sign, but it's actually, it's actually our family rule that says, for our best interest right now in your life, this is, this is where we're going to just say your boundary is going to be. And I said, in your life right now, there are some things to the best of our understanding of what God wants for us as a family to please him and to be obedient to his word. We, we just believe this would be a safe place for us to be and honor him. Doesn't mean that the people that are beyond that boundary 
are disobeying God. That's between them and God. It doesn't all altogether mean that it's a sin. I don't always know, but I know for us, this is how we live with a clear conscience. This is how we live faithful to the Word of God. Does that make sense, sis? She, she nodded her head at least. I, I think she got it at least. Do you know doing that kind of stuff takes energy, doesn't it? It, t it takes a resolve in your heart to say, this is worth the conversation, as painful as it may be. I'm not God, and I'm, I'm, there's no vacancy in the Trinity, so I'm not putting in an application for any of that, but I'm, I'm telling you, God needs his people to be willing to make bold moves, action-oriented moves, and moves that come in consistency with good boundaries and convictions of God's word. And not be a jerk about it. I mean, not be a judgmental jerk. Just be loving. I said jerk, didn't I? That wasn't very nice. I'm used to talking to city people, so I hope you're okay with that. The letter D. Discernment. Action, boldness, convictions, and discernment. Discernment comes as, as, we, as we exercise our values in our thinking, and we begin to sense what, what is good, and what is best. And discernment, I, I kind of think, kind of puts up a radar for us that begins to sense that ahead could be this potential conflict if I don't adjust, or this will help me stay on the right path. The Bible helps us to understand that those who are growing in grace actually do grow in discernment. The scripture tells us that. I find it, I find it extremely interesting how undiscerning Jacob is before God's call to the altar. But how quickly his discernment begins to sharpen as he begins to say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to be. So let's, let's do it. So we've got to live in this world. We, we've got to live in this age. We can't go back to another century, another generation. Technology's here to stay. Life is here. We, we deal with it, don't we? So we've got to be discerning people in this world. So maybe I could just ask you a few questions about discernment. Discernment is using a spiritual radar that is tuned to God's spirit and God's word. Do you think a spiritually discerning person can comfortably watch something that portrays or makes light of infidelity and cruelty, nudity, profanity, drunkenness, sexual innuendo. You think a spiritually discerning person can do that comfortably? Do you think a discerning, spiritually minded person can just get caught up in that mindless, crass joking that happens so many times in locker rooms and break rooms and around the water cooler or on the job site that honestly is, is not good for the soul? Do you think a, a discerning young person could Blindly accept a date without knowing the spiritual condition of the person that's asking. You need to have a spiritual radar. Do you think a discerning Christian parent should think maybe about the kind of things that their children are signing them up for? There's so much to be learned by involvements in these school activities and those sports opportunities and these character building ways, but 
pardon the figure of speech, but sometimes the tail can wag the dog sometimes, can't it, until the family is chasing every opportunity. And sometimes a spiritually discerning parent has to say, we're just too busy. It's hurting us. Can a spiritually discerning worker just accept the promotion or the job transfer without first thinking, what's this going to require of me? Where is this going to place us? What now is the company going to expect of me? You see what I'm referring to when I say spiritual discernment is like having that sonar radar that, that just, just helps us to see that's a potential problem. I want to avoid that. And I think the discerning mind of Jacob in the moments as they're pulling up stakes and selling real estate and moving to Bethel, they say, this isn't going to work there. Let's just leave it here. Does a spiritually discerning lady have any responsibility for how she presents herself in public? I'm not blaming the lady, but I'm just asking, does a spiritually discerning person have any kind of responsibility? On the flip of that, does a spiritually discerning man have some responsibility for, the, for how he speaks to and compliments and looks at a member of the opposite sex in his life, realizing that sometimes his words and actions may convey things that he didn't intend. A spiritually discerning individual learns quickly and early to respond to the promptings of the Spirit. And the Spirit calls us and warns us and reproves us You know, if, if prayer is only for emergency use only, you know, one of the things that we're going to do is miss out on those, those moments where God's just going to tune us and calibrate our compass to help us avoid things that are dangerous. Alertness of soul and spirit is cultivated with a mindfulness in prayer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to my young unmarried friends for just a moment. Ladies, if, uh, if he doesn't have a spiritual pulse, you have no business hitching your wagon to him. Very concerned about some young people I pastored some years ago. I made a bold statement. I said, if if he won't take spiritual leadership seriously, you need to break it off with him. And if you're even engaged with him, break it off. And I haven't recanted yet. Guys, if, if you're not settled spiritually, you have no business getting into a spiritual or into a serious relationship yet. You, you need your house in order first. Let's go back to the creation story. And God creates Adam first and then Eve. And he, in those moments that he has Adam all by himself, he gives Adam the instructions. Because God needed some one-on-one -on -one time with Adam. He needed to be able to talk to him without distraction. And there is nothing like a beautiful lady to distract us guys, is there? I like to think that uh, we're smarter than that, but I have a pretty good sense that God knows us guys need some remedial courses before marriage. And so uh, he... He thinks we need more work than the ladies, so he gives us extra homework, extra time, extra one-on-one, -on -one because 
We need to get it real clear in our minds what God's calling us to do and what he wants us to be. I'm going to talk to you like a Dutch uncle. Boys, get your spiritual house in order before you expect a girl to follow you. You'll do her and yourself a favor. That's why we have revival for one reason. Boy, I'm in the weeds. I am so in the weeds tonight. Hey, it's been nice knowing you. If I don't see you by the end of the week, let's uh, say it was a good time. Mutual cooperation. Personal responsibility, spiritual leadership, mutual uh, cooperation. Verse 4, they gave to Jacob. They journeyed together, verse 5. Here's, here, here it is, beautiful team effort, combined effort. There's no halting, arguing, none of that hinted in this story. Jacob casts the vision, leads the way, and they follow. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. That is a tall order. But you'll not find a more beautiful example. Jesus loves us, and he leads us, and he does it so beautifully. I got to land this plane. So young people, I hope, I hope that some of this can prepare a bit of a vision for you when you think about what, what God wants to do with your life. But you know, there's some of us here that uh, we're several years into this, and it's kind of messy. Jacob's in a pretty big mess by this moment himself. He's got a lot of scars and a lot of collection of regrets over his life. A few years ago, I was, I was preaching a long ways from home. It was the last day of of the meeting, and this, uh, this man approached me that was nearing his retirement years of life, and he said, I don't think I'll ever see you again, so I think I feel safe to talk to you. And he began to pour out his life of regrets and some very embarrassing, shameful things of his history that he was trying so desperately to work away from and get victory over and to start anew. Here's a man probably approaching 70 or so, I'm not sure. He said, the thing that grieves me the most is I've, I've lost the respect of my son through my failings. He said, but I've had a glimmer of hope. We weren't too far removed from Father's Day that particular year, and he said... Um, I got a card from my son for Father's Day that I cherish deeply. His son knew that his dad loved to golf. And so the card had a golfer theme to it. And as I recall what that father told me, the card said it was something along this line. It said, Dad, even though the front nine weren't too good, I have confidence that you'll make the back nine better. What would you give for your son or daughter to be able to say that to you? What would you give for the God of eternity to say that to you? That your back nine can be better than your front nine. This is not an altar call message. This is a sit and soak message. God put a lot of details about Jacob's life in here for us. Let's pray about it. Father, <laughs> you know how to push our buttons. You know how to talk to our hearts. So we're not going to duck or dodge or run tonight. We're just going to say, let your light shine on us let it let it work into us where there are regrets
take the club out of the hand of the accuser tonight, I pray. And where, where there are young people who have a clean slate, a life ahead of them, would you ground them and guide them, point them in your ways. And may the God of Jacob be our God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank mm-hmm. you.